Um, welcome to the Department of English Graduate and Awards reception. We're so glad you're here. Um, I'm Director of Communications for the English Department. My name is Kristen LaRue Sandler, and my entire job is to introduce our fabulous chair and speaker for today's event, Krista Ratcliffe. She is Foundation Professor and Chair of the Department of English. Her research focuses on intersections of rhetoric, feminist theory, and critical race studies. She is a frequently sought after speaker and consultant on the concept of rhetorical listening, a strategy she developed to aid in cross-cultural communication. Ratcliffe is the author or editor of eight books and has served as president of the Rhetoric Society of America and the Coalition of Feminist Scholars in the History of Rhetoric and Composition. She is a fellow of the Rhetoric Society of America. Let's welcome Krista Ratcliffe. I feel compelled to say I didn't invite myself to speak. Um, the person who was supposed to speak had a family emergency, so I'm sort of pitch hitting. So uh, welcome, everybody. And graduates, congratulations. We have all gathered here today to celebrate you and your accomplishments. You have earned your degrees in film and media studies, or in English with a concentration in creative writing, secondary ed, linguistics, literature, or writing rhetorics and literacies. What all these majors have in common is they focus on language use, on representation, and on interpretation. That means you have learned, among other things, how language is coded by its context, how literature and media represent different ways of being human, and how writing offers ways of imagining new worlds. My hope for you is that your university education has equipped you with skills for pursuing a rewarding career, and even more importantly, a rewarding personal life. To that end, I am tempted to quote Tennyson's poem, Ulysses. His final line is, to strive, to seek, to find, but not to yield. Now what I have just said could have been said in almost in a year, but it's important to remember that graduations always occur in a specific time and place. This 2024 graduation at ASU is occurring during a moment of great division in our world, in places both near and far. So within this context, my other hope for you is that your education has equipped you with the habits of mind that will encourage you to think deeply and critically about all the complex issues facing us, and then to act intentionally as citizens of the world. To that end, I am tempted to invoke Edna St. Vincent Millay's poem, An Ancient, An Ancient Gesture, which questions Ulysses' heroic action, actions in terms of their effects on his wife, Penelope. So whom should you champion, Tennyson's Ulysses or Millay's Penelope? Think about it. The choice is yours. As I often tell students in my classes, my job as a professor is not, is not to tell you what to think. My job is to expose you to the many different ways of thinking so that your own values and beliefs are informed values and beliefs. Even more importantly, my job is to help you learn many different tactics for thinking critically, whether about poetry or climate change or book banning. While earning your degrees in FMS or English, you've developed a set of skills that will travel with you beyond the classroom. You've learned to analyze, that is to break something into its component parts and explain how it works. You have learned to interpret, that is to figure out what something means in all its complexity. You have learned to evaluate, that is to assign value. And you have learned to communicate your own ideas in ways that other people can actually hear them. As we all know, it's difficult to communicate across differences. It's easier to communicate with people who agree with us. It's, e it's also easier to dismiss those who disagree. In 2016, the term cancel culture 
enter the dictionary to describe such dismissals. Georgetown University professor Michael Eric Dyson discussed cancel culture during his 2021 visit to ASU when he dis discussed his book, Long Time Coming, with students. Professor Dyson cautioned against canceling others and advocated instead for classrooms and life situations wherein a wide variety of views are engaged and interrogated. He said his problem with cancel culture whether it's used by people on the right, left, or center, is its, quote, inability to acknowledge that human beings are flawed and have foibles and make mistakes, end quote. Echoing his ministerial training, he argues for the possibility of redemption. Quote, even actions alone that feel hostile may ultimately be redemptive. We should be redeemed. We should redeem each other. We should have enough space to have nuance and complication and to overcome the things we do that are horrible." End quote. Stephen Colbert is a case in point. In 2014, he was the subject of a Twitter campaign to cancel Colbert for a satiric but acontextual tweet about Asians. When asked in 2021 about cancel culture, Colbert reflected on his ethical responsibility as a comedian, saying, quote, I never hide behind, it's only a joke, end quote. But his main point was this, quote, I have come to believe that saying to historically marginalized people, y'all gotta just take a joke, is a little detached. You can say it, but I think it might be a little self-centered to think that your intention is more important than the effect of your work. Though Colbert stressed that people may say anything they want, he also stressed that people must live with the consequences of their words. These reflections caused, caused him to deepen his understanding and act more intentionally, to redeem himself, I suppose, in a way that Dyson advocated. Dyson's talk has remained with me, particularly his recognition that difficult conversations are rife with possibilities for mistakes. But as I have tried to teach my daughter, Mistakes need not be imagined as failures that forever define us. Rather, mistakes may be reframed as opportunities for learning, for growing, for doing better, for succeeding. So whenever the impulse to dismiss or cancel comes over me, I pause and do three things to facilitate difficult conversations. First, I try to be generous and give people the benefit of the doubt, ascribing to them the best possible motives. That costs me nothing. Second, I remind myself that there's always more to the story, more than just what I know from my own life. And I try to be aware of the privileges I'm bringing to the conversation. And third, I choose to perform optimism by simply working the problem those of you that have worked with me, you've heard that phrase, let's just work the problem. I'm not into blaming or shaming. As President Obama noted when addressing attendees at the Gates Foundation event, performing optimism is important. Quote, your response, he says, has to, to reject cynicism and reject pessimism and push forward. <clears throat> Whoops. With a certain I'm sorry, and push forward with um, a certain infectious and relentless optimism. Not blind optimism, not one that ignores the scale and scope of our challenges, but that hard-earned optimism that's rooted in the stories of very real progress that has occurred throughout human history. Who or what are examples of such optimism? Well, I invite you all to reflect on that question and come up with your own answers. But for me, one example is Robin Wall Kimmerer, who is a SUNY environmental biology professor and a member of the Potawatomi Nation. She wrote her book, Braiding Sweetgrass, to encourage readers to reorient our relationships to the land. Recounting a field trip with biology students to the Great Smoky Mountains to study moss spiders, she writes, 
I had given the students so much biological information that all the patterns and the processes laid on so thick as to obscure the most important truth. How will people ever care for the fate of moth spiders if we don't teach students to recognize the world as gift? As gift that offers both sustenance and lessons for living. Graduates, your education is a gift. A gift you've given yourself with, I imagine, a fair amount of help along the way. And you yourselves are gifts to everyone here in the room and to everyone who you will have yet to meet. As the world faces 21st century problems, humanities graduates like you need to use your gifts as part of, part of interdisciplinary teams to solve our problems. What do you have to offer? Well, when I worked at Purdue University, an oft-told story was um, about engineers who had gone into a third world country to build wells and who went back a year later to find out that no one was using the wells. Why? Well, because the women in the village regularly met at the same time every day to talk and walk to the river to gather water. If the women used the wells closer to their homes, their time together would have been curtailed. Community trumped convenience. Culture trumped technology. If any of you had been sitting at that table during the design phase of that project, the wells would probably have been located in a different spot. Because you understand the importance of storytelling and critical thinking, of analyzing and interpreting both literary and cultural information, and of listening and communicating with audiences in ways they can actually hear you. So, have you decided? Are you Team Ulysses or Team Penelope? As for me, I love both poems. Whenever faced with an either-or choice, I try to imagine a both-and scenario, a metamodern mindset reminiscent of everything everywhere all at once. This both-and thinking doesn't always work, but it does work more often than you might imagine. So with this idea in mind, I'll conclude by wishing you graduates Ulysses' spirit of adventure and perseverance, combined with Penelope's understanding of people and consequences. Congratulations and good luck. <laughs> I now shift gears to my MC role. Kristen tells me she's not coming back up. So um, our next speaker uh, is a student speaker, Chris, <coughs> excuse me, Hoshnik. He's the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences Dean's Medalist in English. Originally from Sweetwater, Arizona in the Navajo Nation, Hoshnik is graduating with a bachelor's degree in English as an online student. While completing his degree, he has taken full advantage of the opportunities offered and contributed. And he's contributed a great deal to the department in return. He was a 2022 Writing Fellow with the Emerging Diné Writers Institute, a 2023 Screenwriting Fellow with the Native American Media Alliance Writers Seminar, and a 2023 UC Berkeley Arts Research Center Poetry and Senses Fellow. Additionally, Chris served as a translator of Dene Bazad for the Piper Center's Thousand Languages Project. In 2023, he received the Indigenous Poets Prize from the Hayden's Ferry Review, a journal here in the department. Chris's writing has been featured in literary journals, and in the spring of 2024, he was awarded a fellowship from the Dene Artisans and Authors for Capacity Building Institute which supports the development of creative entrepreneurs in New Mexico. After graduation, he will be pursuing a Master of Fine Arts in Creative Writing at the Institute of American Indian Arts. So please join me in welcoming Chris Hoshnick. Hello. Can everybody hear me? Yeah? Okay, just making sure. Um, all right, well, um, first, I just wanna say um, hello, Department of English, uh, faculty, uh, staff, and hopefully future employers. Um, I want to start off with a quote from Virginia Woolf um, as it relates to uh, this afternoon. Um, 
Love making, after 25 years, can't bear to be separate. You see, it is enormous pleasure being wanted. So the reason why I quote Virginia is because I initially wanted to say no to the speaking opportunity. Um, being an online student, I understood Virginia's perspective on marriage. After all, um, up until now, I only ever really felt wanted by my laptop. Um, however, I felt I had to say yes so that I so that after I complete a doctorate program elsewhere, everyone in this room can see this moment on my CV again and remember that's the Virginia Woolf guy. Um, and uh, by also reframing this invitation as a love letter, um, to quote Virginia again, I owe all the happiness of my life to you. You have been entirely patient with me and incredibly good. I want to say that everybody knows it. If anybody if anybody could have saved it, me, it could have been you. So to the Department of English, um, thank you. You guys are my Vita. Um, also in response to my journey towards a PhD, I did find that an MFA, pro, um, an MFA is indeed um, terminal, which means I don't need to become a doctor to teach creative writing, but I already made my parents request time off work today. Um, so in short, I think I'll be back a little bit sooner than I thought. Um, that's if you guys will have me. Um, my parents have done a lot for me over the last two years, giving me the space to doom scroll social media, uh, learn a new language, relearn my own language, Denebizad or Navajo, and for funding my coffee addiction. Um, so in essence, I dedicate this achievement to them. Um, I want to also say that um, ASU has been the most fun I've had without laughing. Um, I started writing and film and media years ago. I was so successful in my time doing that that I've worked my way up into extreme poverty. Um, as time passed, I learned uh, being moderately funny wasn't enough to write the next Oscar-winning screenplay. Um, I related to this quote by um, Groucho Marx um, at the time as I transitioned into another form of writing poetry. Um, I find television very educating. Every time somebody turns on the set, I go into the other room and read a book. Um, I was so scared ending my uh, 20s in an undergraduate program back that then um, because restarting your career means relearning the world. Um, plus, I changed my mind a lot, um, but I put my trust in faculty members uh, Ruby Maxow, um, Jackie Balderrama, Tyler Peterson, and just to name a few. Um, I thank you for your guidance through this new world of language and poetry I now call home. Um, which brings me back to the relevatory MFA. Um, a few weeks ago, I was accepted into the Institute of American Indian Arts graduate program for poetry. Um, so I guess that goes without saying that they have great taste too. Um, so before I end my time here, I want to emphasize again through the power of words, my deepest appreciation and respect for the Department of English staff and faculty, and also for this moment being my final inquiry for employment. Um, and as I come to close, uh, close here, I'd like to center the conversation back to the importance of language. Um, I've been deconstructing the way I experience grief lately. Uh, grief, I have noticed in this nation, seems like a luxury. A feeling we get to experience every so often on the other side of the world. Um, it, a feeling that we get to experience every so often, but on the other side of the world, it's not just a feeling, it's a state of being. I'm also fascinated with something Natalie Diaz said in an interview, and I'm not sure where this came from, um, but she said, what are you willing to compromise in order for nation to love you? I wanna close with a poem in response to that, and towards the family we see on social media, our only means of connection and community right now, who are compromising more than their bodies to discover what love feels like. Um, this one is called uh, The Bone Collector. In the event of a disaster, people will try to leave a building the same way they entered, the bone collector said. If I point to my brow, will you leave my body the same way you entered, I asked. To identify a body, a coroner will ask the family to view the body in photographs. The body will never be viewed in person. This is not a Hollywood film. Here they will be asked to remember splinters in the wood under its canvas, and they will either say, no, we do not recognize it, or they will say, yes, that is him. 
My family said, no, we don't recognize it. Forensics identify my gender by caressing my pelvis, sheepskin tethered at each end. How old do you think he is, the bone collector asked. He called the long bones of my arms and legs banisters. The bruises on his cheek drape, the bone collector said. Like a teepee, said the pathologist. They laughed. I laid on the table under the fluorescent. They bled like spilt wine on a white woman's blouse, like xenomorph guts. I am a Western film, I said, and my hollows are your resting place. Fingerprints and teeth are special, the bone collector said. Why, I asked. Because you are either a career waitress smoking Newports or worse, he said. What's worse, I asked again. Have you been to the dentist, he said. I did not answer. Well, unidentifiable it is, he said. The bone collector snuck me out to the back of his morgue. His waxy nose shine like Christmas lights glistening on a bar top. The pitter-patter of rain on his car window fogged like a 90s R&B song. This part slurs like a Kerouac prose. I am your mongrel, your bestia. I am a hearse faith drawn to your Sunday school, I said. And I will let you pull under this rug, second coat this living room wall. This body is your home, I said. More like a subdivision, one native is every native, he laughed. Like Burt Lancaster? I asked. No, you are a house, he said. The not a spectacle, I asked. His icy fingers roared across my ceramic tiles. A self-described pocha once called those her teeth. They have bitten into Whitman lines, savored it, caused an avalanche onto Rockwell fantasies. The bone collector took me out of his back seat and brought me into his sanction. S Secret squirrel played in the background. Little footsteps, crackling oil. He put me in the back room. Hang it in the bedroom above the baby's crib. Let's call it teeth, a woman said in Tilda's. Why don't we call it what it was before we found it, a child said. I erected from the wall and said, would you ask my family again, please? Thank you. Our final speaker today is Bob Summers. He is the co-founder of the Changing Hands Bookstore. Um, he co-founded it with Gail uh, Shanks, who's a Department of English alumna. They founded the bookstore in 1974, so this is the store's 50th anniversary. Okay. Bob will talk for just a couple minutes, and then he'll distribute gift cards to any graduating uh, ASU student in attendance. Just a couple minutes, you wish. <laughs> <laughs> if it gets bad, uh, you can start clearing your throat. I'm very responsive. Shuffling your feet won't work on this carp. I'll start with a reading, one paragraph actually, from a story by William Trevor, Irish writer. <clears throat> the town that was nearest was 13 miles away where the mountain slope became a plain and the river that flowed through the townland of Ennismolach was bridged. The rectory was reached from Dunan Crossroads by taking the road to Corley Gap and turning right three miles farther on at the cluster of houses around Hogan's Grocery and Bar and the Shell Petrol Pump. A few minutes later, there was the big Catholic Church of the Holy Assumption solitary and splendid by the roadside, still seeming all new, still seeming new, although it had been there for 60 years. Over the brow of the next hill were the gates to Ennismalach Rectory, its long curving avenue years ago returned to grass. The words. If I were writing a story, highly unlikely. I'd populate the text not with Irish place names, but perhaps with local ones. A recent piece I read described the drive up I-17 to Flagstaff using road names, Indian School, Camelback, Cactus, Carefree, 
Sunset Point, Bumblebee, Badger Springs, Montezuma Castle, Montezuma Well, Pinewood. But no, my road list would be word candy for book lovers. Tilly Olson, Toni Morrison, Salman Rushdie, Edward Abbey, Celeste Eng, Italo Calvino, Yeon Lee, Raymond Carver, Vladimir Nabokov, Terry Tempest Williams, and my favorite, Chimananda Ngozi Adichie. Words. In 1965, in the spring, a young woman and I were sitting in the quad on the lawn in front of Old Main. With us was a professor from the Department of English. I'll call the young woman J.M. and the professor John Ellis. Dr. Ellis was teaching us Greek. Can't quite remember how that happened. It was the first of what turned out to be only two such lessons. We were learning to translate the opening lines of the Gospel of John. <clears throat> in archeologos, keologos in proston theon, kai theos in ologos. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. I've thought about this often over the years, but it wasn't until preparing this, these notes that, it was, that I sensed that it was remarkably prescient that an English professor was telling J.M., who would herself become an English professor and published poet, and telling her boyfriend, who would open a small bookstore nine years later with a couple of friends, was telling these two that the word was God, and they listened. Thank you, Professor Ellis. Thank you, ASU English Department. Good luck to the grads and all the rest of us. Amen.